Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Tom's Hardware Show. I'm Sharon, and it's October 22nd, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, which means it's time to kick things off live. Yes, hello everyone, we are live like we are every week. And just like any other week, we are taking questions from the audience. So if you have anything you'd like to ask, just drop your question into the chat on Facebook or YouTube and we'll be answering questions by the end of the show. So let's meet our amazing guests we have joining us today. Uh, first is senior editor, Andrew Friedman. What's going on, Andrew? Amazing, really, like get, you go, go to my head here, Sharon. Uh, I mean. <laughs> Been having a really busy week, but good to see you. And so, um, what's been? Um, well, I like to ask what's in the lab, but I guess what's in your <laughs> apartment right now? <laughs> Home lab. Oh, we get a lot of stuff, and I mean, some of it we're going to go over um, in a little bit deeper, I think, in an upcoming segment. But for those watching, I will stand. Ooh. Whoa. Uh, we have, we have, I kind of stand. Can I think it's not that heavy? Oh. We have the log we have the Logitech chair. Oh, uh, the um. This is not, a, if that's not on the site yet. Oh, refocusing on me. There we go. Um, that's the. Is it Herman, comfy? It's extremely comfy. So it's the Herman Miller X Logitech Embody Gaming Chair. And it is really comfy. And we're going to have a full review of this, similar to other gaming chairs we've done. Um, so I'm not going to spoil everything, but it is very comfy and very expensive. And How much we'll, is it? It is one thousand four hundred ninety-five U.S. dollars. Hey, can you buy it? You can buy it. So it's unlike the thirty ninety. It's it's unlike the thirty ninety. You you can buy it. I think they have limited quantities. It says on the website, so like there may be a little bit of a wait depending on when you order. Um, it's very comfy, very adjustable. There are a few changes they've made to to it over the standard office and body that Herman Miller makes, but it is also very largely that chair. Wow, well, I, I'll have to stay tuned for that review. I'd really love to know what goes into a $1,500 chair. I'm sitting in about a $10 chair. You can't even see it. It's like a piece of metal. <laughs> well, that's actually something that's interesting about this chair is before I stand up in it, you can't see that I'm in like a big gaming chair. Like I feel like you see Jared has like the big gaming chair and for like, on you know, you're streaming. The secret on lab. You're streaming on Twitch or something. And, you know, that is like a bit of a status symbol, right? Whereas something like this, it's it's not a status symbol. It's just a chair there for ergonomic purposes and not, you know, not for the looks. So that I thought is an interesting approach. But at fifteen hundred dollars, I almost wish it was a little bit of a status symbol. Yeah, I you mean, know, like you, my you chair can recline, cool dude. On, on the back, on the back here. <laughs> what do you got? Some well going? Yeah, let's bring blue. that. All right, all right. <laughs> you got some blue. So that counts, right? It's worth a dollar or two, sure. That just <laughs> looks like part of the back of the chair is missing. <laughs> well, we'll have to stay tuned um, for the review on the site, which I guess will probably be up soon, maybe by next week. Um, but to introduce us to our other guests, we've got Jared Walton, Senior Graphics Editor, Tom Hardware. What's up, Howdy. Jared? So what have you been up to this week? Um, so earlier this week, I looked at NVIDIA's reflex latency analyzer kit which is actually the pc in the back there that's that's one of their 360 hertz alienware um displays and with a logitech g pro mouse that's like it's actually a special edition um you can't actually buy it but it has reflex enabled and so it can do the timing that's necessary to measure latency um, unfortunately it only works with nvidia gpus right now well, not right now, but that's that's what it's designed for. But NVIDIA does have an LDAT kit. That's their latency display, or I don't know, something analyze, analyzer tech, I don't, whatever LDAT stands for. But I'm trying to get one of those so that we can actually do similar latency tests on other monitors, and we'll see how that goes. But uh, it was, I mean, it's, it's hard to convey without actually feeling it, but it's like, yeah, 360 hertz with reduced latency is... It's noticeable. Um, when you're in your 40s, it probably doesn't matter as much as when you're in your 20s or teens or whatever. But uh, I imagine, you know, your your top esports pros and such would definitely benefit from, you know, faster 
refresh rates and reduced latency. So that was kind of cool. And uh, I mean, it's no secret next week is the launch of the RTX 3070. So the, the big question is, will there actually be inventory? <laughs> uh, my guess is there will be cards for sale and they'll all sell out within minutes, if not faster. So, uh, you know, we're still waiting to see how Ampere 3080, 3090 supplies improve. I do have a guy um, that I've chatted with who he ordered a 3090 a month ago and he finally got it today. So, you know, they exist. <laughs> It is possible. If yeah, he, and he's in Europe, so he he ordered it. And I think he paid sixteen hundred euros, which is like almost two thousand dollars. So I'm just like, ouch. Now he's having buyer's remorse. I think and going, maybe I should just buy the thirty eighty. <laughs> so he's buying it for gaming, and you know, like not. For yeah, it's not. For, I don't think it's for professional work. He's he's big into like VR stuff, though, if I remember right. So. You know, maybe it helps there. The 24 gigabyte stuff does have some benefits, but uh, yeah, not not super required for gaming right now. Cool. So, uh, Jared, I know you, like you said, you just did some testing of uh, the Reflex Latency Analyzer, and you could check that out on our site, of course. And you did a lot of benchmarking with mostly Fortnite, right? Yeah. So the cool thing about Fortnite in this particular case is the way the latency analyzer works is... When you click your button, the the mouse connects to the back of the display, and that port senses the mouse click, and and it it can actually report like it, how long it took from the mouse click to get to the display, um, which with the the Logitech G Pro, I think it was averaging like two or two and a half milliseconds or something, pretty small. And then um, you you set a spot on the display like right there. <laughs> uh, you you set a little a rectangle flashes in Fortnite. If you turn it on, it flashes white, and so you set the display to detect when there's a color shift in that area, and you can configure where the color shift is. But in Fortnite, you just set it to this rectangle, and then it's really easy to sit there. And every time you click that that uh, spot lights up white, and so it can detect how many milliseconds it took between mouse press and the display actually lighting up. And so then it could report your real-time latency. In other games, you'd have to position the rectangle for sensing over like a muzzle flash, um, which which would kind of be problematic if you were doing a game like Fortnite where you're swinging an ax or pickaxe or whatever, and there is no muzzle flash, which is why that little rectangle helps but uh, anyway um, that's that's the core technique there and you know normally if you were trying to measure latency you'd have to have a high speed camera and like you would measure your button click and then you'd try and see when the the frame updated on your screen and you would count the number of frames so if you had like a thousand um, frames per second high speed camera you'd sit there and go oh well it took 25 frames so it took 25 milliseconds which takes a long time i mean you got to record it and then you got to go and analyze the video whereas with this it's like you can get latency results back in a matter of seconds and be like oh yeah uh, it's working as expected or it's not working or what's going on so uh nvidia mentioned like it it can be beneficial for your esports people who go to a tournament and they're like hey i want to make sure my system is configured and working like it should. And so with with a reflex setup, they would be able to confirm that in a very short time. And if there were a problem, they could then you know complain to the event organizers. Um, so I don't know how, I'm not an esports person, so I don't really know how much that would matter, but I, I've watched some of those guys and, and people and you're like, wow, they're, they're way tuned into the game. So shaving off milliseconds from your um, system latency from click to seeing it on the screen, that, that can make a difference. So. So when, when you were testing, did you find that some like lower end graphics card or maybe higher end graphics card saw greater benefit, greater reduction in latency? Right. So your latency is, it's a, product of you know your actual latency from your mouse and from your monitor and from your system which ties into your cpu and your gpu so a faster system will reduce your latency so you know i tested with like a gtx 1660 super i tested with a 2070 super and i tested with a 3080 
and uh, you know the faster your high, your frame rate, the lower the latency because it just your your whole system GPU and CPU processed it that much more quickly. Um, AMD's ref like AMD's equivalent to Reflex already sort of existed, and it was it's called AMD Radeon Anti Lag. Um, there's no like short of doing the high speed camera thing. There's no good way to measure that. Nvidia's had Reflex out for what a month or more. I I want to say they had ways to reduce latency before that, but um, not something I've really spent a lot of time trying to measure before just because it's time consuming and um, and I'm not the monitor reviewer. So I was like, oh, well, I'll just worry about graphics cards. But uh, anyway, the, the basic idea is you want to, like if you're rendering at say 500, well, let's be a little more realistic, 300 frames per second. Um, and your display is running at 60 hertz, right? So your display has an update every 16 and 16.7 milliseconds. Um, but your CPU is sitting there in the background rendering all these frames. And so if it finishes rendering one frame and it goes to the next frame and renders that and next frame and renders that, you get this thing where it's like, oh, well, we've got five frames rendered that actually don't need to be shown. And so it kind of, short circuits that and goes, hey, what's the most recent frame that's rendered, tries to get that most recent mouse information and input information updated and cuts out some of that buffering and reduces your um, system latency. And so in my testing, it looked like, especially at kind of medium frame rate, so like anywhere from 60 to maybe 120, um, your latency, almost got cut in half by turning on reflex versus having it off. And, you know, it's in some cases, it's basically take the the frame time in milliseconds and double it is what you would have without reflex. Um, so, you know, it, it's a pretty big difference. Like if you're at 40 frames per second, you're looking at like, oh, well, 80 milliseconds latency versus 40 milliseconds latency. And that's very noticeable. What do it you does think, shut Andrew? off incidentally. It shuts off reflex if you go below 30 frames per second, because at that point, I guess, who cares? <laughs> You're screwed anyway at that point. So. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was going to ask Andrew. Question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, actually, I have a, a question because I see the you got that Logitech mouse on top of the case behind you. So how many mice are compatible with this? Um, right now, so basically it's kind of, only for hardware reviewers right now is my understanding. I mean, like you could buy some of this stuff, like the displays for sale, I think now there's an Alienware display and an Asus display and an Acer display is either coming or it's out. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and then the mice, there's the Logitech that's, this mouse exists, but not with Reflex. That will be in a future product. Uh, there's a Razer mouse, which I believe is, there's like beta firmware that they've given to reviewers so that they right. could test with it. There's an Asus uh, mouse that I think it's available for purchase. And then there was a uh, Steel Series mouse that they listed that I think is available for purchase. But I only got the one mouse and the one monitor. So I don't know <laughs> if any of this okay. is actually really available for purchase or coming in the next month kind of thing. But it, it should be soon anyway. Well, so the, it's just a it's just a firmware that's needed to make the mice work. So couldn't they theoretically put it in many mice? Well, so that's that's where it's not entirely clear to me. It sounds like they added some custom hardware to a Logitech G Pro and put on special firmware to make this work. But they're not planning on selling this particular configuration. They're actually working on a new mouse that will have all the hardware and firmware and stuff in it. Uh, Razer, it sounds like maybe their their mouse already had the necessary hardware to do it. I, it's it's a little confusing to me as well. It's like, wait, so what's where? I, it, like, there has to be something in the mouse to either send a timestamp along with the click or like there's some other data that it's sending for the monitor to detect. And like, if you use it with a non-reflex mouse, um, NVIDIA said they tested like the top 30 gaming mice and they actually did like uh, either high-speed camera or LDAT testing or whatever, but something where they could click and measure the latency and doing that, they were able to 
basically create a database of all of these 30 mice and say, this is the latency for this mouse and this is the latency for this mouse. So it can give you an estimated latency, system latency with other mice, but, uh, but it's not going to be as accurate. What about keyboards? Uh, keyboards aren't part of it. Boo. So, <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> I, I guess the idea is like your mouse is uh, your mouse has a higher pulling rate and it, it really ties into your movement and looking or, and such. Whereas like when you press a key to move forward or jump, there's you know there's acceleration in most games where it's like you don't instantly turn or or whatever when you touch a keyboard. So that's my understanding is they've only focused on the mouse side because that's more of a factor for you know your esports pros. So uh, in terms of the 360 hertz monitors, we I know the ASUS, well, there are two ASUS monitors, one with reflex and one that doesn't have reflex. The one that does not have reflex, um, we have tested and you can, it is on sale. I don't know if it's in stock right now, but you can buy it and we reviewed it on our website, so. Yeah, and, and it's important to note like the, the reflex latency analyzer stuff is kind of, it's extra. So like if you bought a 360 hertz G-Sync monitor that didn't support the, the reflex hardware, you would still get the low latency. You just wouldn't have the way of actually tracking it. Cause there's, there's uh, stuff in the on-screen display where you have to position the latency detector um, for the games that, that then ties into NVIDIA's uh, GeForce experience. And so you configure the two and, and you can get a little overlay on your screen saying, you know, here's your real time latency. So, you know, it, it basically does a rolling average of the last 20 mouse clicks and shows what the latency was for those. So do you think they could, well, could or would or will implement this in 144 hertz monitors, you know, those really slow monitors? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, super slow. Uh, well, so th that's kind of the question. I, I think they probably won't, but if you want to measure latency, they have this this tool called LDAT that it's it's a sensor that you can position on your screen rather than using the OSD to move a rectangle around. And so if you wanted to measure latency that way, it's a little bit more cumbersome in some respects, but for for hardware testing, it's not any worse but if you wanted like that real-time feedback as a gamer it, it's an extra step so um i mean i think your top esports people are probably all going yeah we want 240 we want 360 hertz uh, me i'm like my screen that you can't see in front of me is an old school 60 hertz 4k g-sync display from gosh like five or six years ago it still works fine you know but it it's funny because i've got right behind my head is one of the 144 hertz 4k displays with hdr and all that stuff and it's it's nice it looks beautiful but it has a fan in it oh, like yeah. and, and it's it's actually loud like mm -hmm. so i i generally don't use that when i'm testing things because i'm like no i i don't want the the noise when i'm doing noise measurements i'm like no i need to be able to hear the gpu fan not the monitor fan behind me it helps so. cool you off so yeah. Cool while you're I wish. <laughs> it's it's that, noise. Yeah. It, it's it is really loud. I mean, it's it's it raises the noise floor from like 35 decibels in my office to like 42 decibels. So, like for sitting 10 feet away from it, that's pretty noticeable. Awesome. Well, yeah. If you haven't checked it out already, definitely go to tomshardware.com and check out Jared's testing on um, Reflex. You could find all the good stuff there. And if you have any more questions about Reflex and you're watching this right now, put your question in the chat, and I'll definitely try to answer it before the show's over. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Jared, you know that you mentioned it before. Since the 3090 was released, it's nearly impossible to get it. But Andrew just tested a desktop, which is actually one of the ways you can get your hands on a new Ampere card, right? It is. Um, so we actually, we just published the review today. Um, we have the Alienware Aurora R11. And it is, I mean, the chassis is the same as it's been in the last few years, but they've updated it to Ampere parts. So you can get the RTX 3080, the RTX 3090. And that's how the loaner we have uh, right next to me that you'll see in a second came to us was just packed to the gills with a Core i9, 10900KF, and 32 gigabytes of 
Actually, no, it was to the 64. Uh, I'll get the round number in a minute. I totally see so yeah, 64 gigabytes of RAM, and of course the RTX 3090 alongside four terabytes of storage. It's Ooh, you know it's yeah. it's a beast, but it's also a pre-built. But it's also one of the few ways you could actually get one of these. In fact, right before the show, I went on to Dell.com and I configured one the way this was sent to me, and I said. Could I get this? And it would ship in early November if I wanted to, to spend that money on it right now. I mean, granted, this model here is over four thousand dollars, but if you're willing to spend that much and you're getting I mean you're getting other components, you can get the 3090 in it. Now I can show you all around it real quick. Can you get a 3080? There is like, a 3080. I mean... There is a 3080 model. Um you and Dell really lets you configure these things a lot. I didn't check it for shipping right as of the show, but I believe they do have it in stock in general. Yeah, that I mean, was my question is whether it was actually available in stock. Cause I mean, given the price disparity and you know, 10% higher, 15% higher performance at most, I'm like, most people right. don't need to go above the 3080. Yeah. Well, but Andrew did. Yes, yeah, so speaking of it, let me, okay, I'm gonna switch to my handheld camera here. And this is, this is it. This is the Alienware, and I feel like we need around. a sound effect, like a spaceship. Boop, 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 it doesn't boop. do that. You will hear it. You'll see. This is this is the front. We'll ignore. And for those of you listening to this as a podcast, I am very sorry. Okay. But um, it's just a monster when, desktop, guys. Yeah, when it's on, there's a ton of RGB. But you got a lot. This is one thing I really like: just the sheer number of ports you have on the front. We have three USB Type A ports, a USB Type C port, headphone jack, and a separate mic jack. So that's really nice. And this sort of like engine look, it intakes air through a 120 millimeter in the bottom, and then you have a hard drive up at the top. And if you see that this, this is where the power supply is, right? I took the side panel off here, and the power supply is in this sort of swing arm that just swings in, so it lies flush with it, and that's where you, you know, it just closes like that. But inside it, you can see our all of the parts. So this is the inside of the R11, and I mean it may be different based on a configuration you order or CFS buy or whatever. And so you that's, see a, this one that's a really compact looking 3090. I have to say, you know, Alienware, Dell, yeah. whoever, whoever they had create that, that is a very custom design there in order to make it fit in a much narrower length. Yes. Yeah, so this one, they did custom design it. It's 10.5 inches and it's two and a half slots and they have the six pin, eight pin connectors, not the 12 pin connector that you see on the standard one. And it is pretty small. I did take it out. And if you want to go to the review on tomshardware.com, you will be able to see more pictures of it. And the design isn't exactly inspired, but frankly, this does not have, I'm going to switch back to my regular camera. This does not have a glass window or a plexiglass window of any sort on the side. So you're not really ever going to see it, but it is a small one. Um, the thing is that this makes a lot of noise. And it's largely because of, and this has been an issue I've had with the design. I mean, for the design of the chassis for a few years, specifically when we saw it on the R10 with Ryzen chips uh, late last year, is that there is really one big exhaust fan and that's up on the top and it's connected to the CPU cooler and one intake fan, which is the one I told you about earlier. And those are the fans. There are some strategically placed cutouts on the other side that I've taken off. But uh, in fact, here, for those watching at home, I've grabbed the other side, the other side, and it has the top one is for the power supply and the bottom one allows some fresh air to get to the GPU. But that's really it for fans. So this machine gets really, really loud, especially you know when you're gaming, but even like on the desktop, it, it can get loud. So that is sort of the downside to you have this really small chassis. It's like 30, 30 something liters, but you know, you fit a 3090 in. Is that a, I was going to say, is the fan up top mostly making the noise or is it the GPU fans or is it just all of the fans together? I believe it is the fan up top. And it, are I, you I running don't have a, a, I don't have, I don't have a decibel meter here, but like, yeah. I, I believe it to be this one. Is it a 10 900 K that you're using for your CPU in that or what's so in this it? Is, so this one is a 10900K. It appears that on the site right now, they've leaned towards the 10900KF. That's not uncommon to see them, yeah. those sort of be switched between 
based on whatever supply is available. Um, obviously, I'd prefer to 10900K because you get the integrated graphics in case you need it. But otherwise, they're largely the same. Um, Performance-wise, for games, I've got to say, Jared said, yeah, his friend might have had or his had some buyer's remorse in not getting the 3080. And yeah, the 3090 is a beast. It like it did the best on almost every test. There was like, one weird thing with Far Cry New Dawn where the 3080 did like a frame better. But other than that, like there, it was better, but it wasn't that much better for the amount you're paying. So, I mean, this would probably be a killer if you need it to be a creative machine as well. And obviously the looks, like if you're into like this ultra modern look, that's really nice. And it comes with like very little bloatware, but it's loud. And as you have it right now, it's expensive, but you can get a 3090 if you buy this whole computer with it. <laughs> so um, Jared, so if you wanted to save money, well, I guess you can't with this desktop, but if you could get your own 3090 and do your own build, would it be a waste if you just paired it with, let's say like a ninth gen Intel CPU? Not ninth gen, I mean like, it depends on your ninth gen. Basically, I've done some testing and, you know, once you're at the eight core level for Intel, there's not a huge benefit going to like a 10 core, 10 900K. So your 10 700K is like your previous gen 9900K. You know, even though one says it's i7, one says it's i9, um, you're still looking at eight core 16 thread chips. Uh, the 9700K is an eight core, eight thread chip that still runs very fast if you were to go to like the next level down like a 9600k i think you would start to see a, a more sizable drop in performance in some games but then the flip side is like your 10 600k is a six core 12 thread and that's like your old 8700k and it probably you know you're you might lose a few percent at most so it's you know you're you're mostly top tapped out and if you're buying something like a 3090 they're really designed for 4K gaming, but even at 4K gaming, you're still going to be GPU limited. So at that point, you know, I tested with a 3080 with, I think, 10 different CPUs. Um, and it was like, well, some of the Ryzen chips were like 5% slower or 8% slower. The only ones that were really bad were like if you dropped all the way down to like a core i3 or an old core i7, like I tested a 4770K and it's like, yeah, you, you could lose 10 to 15% at 4K with an old CPU. But if you're running at 4K with anything Ryzen 3000 series or, eighth gen or later i7 series, I think you're just fine. So Lamar Elliott asked, or Lamar Elliott is running an, an i9-7980XE. What are your thoughts on pairing that with, uh, I guess, a 3090 or even a 30, I guess, 3090? 30 30 yeah. yeah, so uh, basically Intel's HEDT chips, they're, they're X299 sockets. Or, or platforms, I guess it's LGA 2066. Uh, those perform kind of like in games, they're similar to Ryzen 3000 in that there's more latency in the chips. Like they have more cores, they have more L3 cache, but because of their use of a, um, what's it called? The mesh topology for their, the core interconnects instead of the ring bus. Intel did make some sacrifices in latencies there. And it's not like a huge difference, but it does show up a bit in games. And so like it, it ends up that your 7980XE is probably performance wise going to be similar to like a, a Ryzen 7 2700X or maybe a Ryzen 5 3600X in gaming performance, which is to say like at 4K again, it's not going to matter much. Uh, if you were to run at 1080p, you might see as much as a 15 to 20% Delta, but I don't think most people are looking to buy a 3090 and run at, at 1080p, which is funny because then I've got the reflex monitor behind me that is 1080p and it's like, well, <laughs> yes, there are, there are exceptions to that rule. The problem well, being that- players will run it at 480p. <laughs> right, but the problem being you need a game that is designed to hit high refresh rates and high frame rates. So, right. you know, a game like Assassin's Creed, it doesn't matter what CPU you've got in your system, you're probably not gonna get much above 140 frames per second, even at 1080p or even like 
900p, 720p, whatever, because it ends up CPU limited. But you've got other games like Fortnite will easily get into the 300 plus frames per second at lower settings. Um, same with PUBG, same, uh, especially like CSGO or League of Legends. Those can easily hit into the like 400 frames per second range with a fast system. So Jared, I wanted to answer the question you asked before, which is, could you get the 3080 version of the systems pre-built? And the answer is it's showing at least shipping to, like if I put in my zip code, that it would ship the exact same dates. So you could have it on the 13th if shipping to me with standard shipping or up to the 9th with express delivery, which is 25 bucks. And like you spent, <laughs> you're spending three or four thousand yeah, dollars well on the computer. It. You might as well drop the 25 <laughs> bucks to get it, to get it a few days faster. But yeah, so yeah. that that is available. I can't tell you. I know about a lot of desktops where it's easy to get a 3080 or 3090, which is one of the reasons this is so interesting. And in that like, it's a killer. I mean, it's loud, but it's a killer, and you can buy them. So this is this is one of the interesting things about the RTX 30 series launch. Like, there's a ton of people that have complained, like, oh, it's a paper launch. The chips just aren't out there. It's really actually hard to know how many GPUs Nvidia has shipped. Um, yeah. Maybe they'll maybe they'll release data in a few months. Maybe they won't. They probably won't. But I'm like between big OEMs like Dell wanting to put them into Alienware's and all of their system builder partners wanting to sell them, and worldwide demand is you know, it's it's hard to say how many are actually selling. I, they have said they have they allocated as many. 30 series as they had for the 20 series and i'm like well your 20 series sold out for about a month after launch so you know it'll be interesting to see what happens in the coming month uh jensen actually said that he expected the you know limited to supply well not limited supply but supply unable to meet demand he expected to continue into 2021 so yeah. our our, man, our, manage, our managing editor Matt Safford wrote a review of an iBuy Power gaming desktop that went up earlier this week. That one had a 3080 in it, but by the time he got it and wrote the review, out of stock. They were they were gone. You, you <laughs> couldn't get one. And like honestly, they may be coming in and out, but I think that's the case for a lot of the smaller OEMs. Like they can't guarantee they're gonna have them in stock. So well, if it, you it's were an interesting new way it. to buy a GPU, right? To like, oh I'm gonna buy the system <laughs> it, but which if I think were, is the answer to Steve Curley's question, which is, where is the fun in buying pre-built anyway? Right now, it's because you can get an Ampere card. Yeah, right. I mean, that's fun. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll defend it, which is, I mean, look, you can see behind me. I have my my little guy in a mesh if I see on the floor. I love that I built it. It feels like mine. I love to tinker with it. A lot of people don't have that time or expertise, or honestly, they just don't want to do it. Like people are so, a lot of people are really used to consoles. I don't begrudge anyone for buying a pre-built, whether it's because you can get certain parts, because you like certain chassis looks like this one, or just because you don't know what you're doing otherwise, we have some friends who want to play. Like if people want to play on PC, I hope we can help educate them. Yeah, all of my, all of my PCs, these are all custom built that I put together. But I mean, like I know people who, when you're making like a hundred grand, it's like, hey, do you want to take three hours to build your PC and possibly make a mistake? Or do you just want to spend $200? You know, for a lot of those people, they're like, I'll just pay the money. Like, I, I don't want to deal with the hassle. And they hope for better support. That's hard to guarantee. I'm, I'm yeah, right. super technical. So it's like, I've never had to go to, you know, support unless a part fails for me. But uh, yeah. yeah. But I think I think it's also a big part of the reason we review them on Tom's Hardware is that a lot of people, you know, do buy them. They are actually very popular, and we want to make sure that you're getting the good one. So that's why that's why we review them. That's why Andrew puts in the hours, many many hours. That's, that's what they pay me for. <laughs> uh, so if you have any more questions, either on the Alienware with the RTX 3090 or Nvidia Reflex, or you just want to yell at us, whatever you want to do, <laughs> keep putting your questions into the chat. We are taking a look at them. Um, so in the meantime, I'll show you what I've been working on lately, um, which is actually really pretty. So I'm gonna try to bring it up on camera. I think you'll like looking at it more than you like looking at me. So let's take a little peek. Uh, can you guys see that all right? Yeah. Cool. So just give me one second. Okay, so this is a Varmillo MA108M Moonlight. Um, this is not a brand new keyboard, but what's new about it is that it's recently been updated with new mechanical switches from Varmillo. 
So to give you a quick rundown, um, this company has a line of EC switches uh, with EC standing for electrostatic capacitive. So those switches are different from your standard mechanical switches in that there's no physical contact made between the metal parts when you press a key. So instead of a gold cross point contact like Cherry MX switches have, these switches register an input by calculating electrostatic capacity and it uh, you know registers the input when that reaches a certain value. So basically, because there's no physical contact, the lifespan is supposed to be longer than your traditional mechanical switches. Um, this is the same kind of tech you'll find in toe prey switches. Those are really popular among keyboard enthusiasts, and they're pretty expensive to find if you can find it in a keyboard. Um, the difference here is these vermil switches. They don't use a tactile rubber dome or a cone-shaped spring, which is what Topra uses. Instead, they have a standard spring and plastic slider like traditional cherry switches. So I actually have one of the new switches to show you all. But first, I wanted to hear what you guys think of at least the look of this keyboard, because I am like pretty obsessed with it. I love Does it have it. RGB lighting? No, it doesn't. It only has white backlighting. Oh, fail. I like that it kind of. I like that it kind of blends the look of like a standard gaming PC and like an old IBM one, but also like the ones that people DIY, like when they buy the, like a lot of those do like cool color palettes. So it kind of like reminds me of the best of all threes. I really do like that look. It's very like subtle, but also just really cool. Yeah, yeah. I think it's mature, but with a pop of fun. I want to know how it feels like and how it sounds. Is it clicky or is it oh. pretty quiet? Okay, yeah, so I could just, here, I could just put put it a little closer to the mic. I mean, it's backwards for me, but. Would you, it seems like it's almost as loud as an MX Blue, or maybe not. No, I have the mic right up next to it. Um, so I'd say it's a little bit louder than Reds are, because these are both linear switches. Um, but I'd say it's louder than a Red, but, um, and closer to that thock kind of noise, but not the full on. Um, yeah. And of course, I'm typing aggressively as well. But, typing these are, purpose. <laughs> these are um, PBT keycaps, so they also feel um, magnificent. So let me show you my face. <laughs> also, here's um, a look at the switch. So what I have, um, so it's called um, Vermilo EC Sakura V2. They have three different um, switches in the V2 line. So I have the Sakura right here. It's meant to be like, it's so it has like a lot of the same specs as a Cherry Red, four millimeters travel, a uh, two millimeter um, actuation point, 45 grams of force, but it's just so smooth. So when you're pressing a red switch, I, it's it's hard because I mean, I feel, notice it when I put them side by side, like you can tell, you know, like a switch is like a stem and there's a plastic going, you know, through it. But the these switches almost feel like there's there's nothing under the keycaps, like it's hollow under there almost. So it's really, really smooth, um, just as light as red, but almost feeling more airy and like as a lighter switch, like um, kale, silent, box res, for example, have 35, require 35 grams of force and they feel really light and airy. These ha require more force, but still feel very um, airy and just really, really smooth. Um, I don't like linear switches, but I, I am, you know, learning. To I'd love. love to try one of those out. I mean, that that looks like a pretty sweet switch design. So, I'm I'm not super big on this on the loud clicky keyboard. So I I'm more of a fan of those linear switches, <laughs> even though I have a blue in front of me. So I yeah. see some comments saying clean <laughs> my <laughs> desktop. Um, it's actually paint on my desktop. Um, I paint on top of the desk and I just let the paint fall everywhere. So <laughs> just so we all know. It's uh, art. It's art. Um, yeah, so curious what you what you guys think. Jared wants to try it out, but I'll have to finish my review first. If you want to <laughs> mail it to me at. Oh. Yeah, it looks I, nice. I and uh, I, I mean, if it feels good and it works good, that's all I really need. I'm I'm not. So even though I made the joke about RGB before, I, I don't really care that much. Um, it, it's I'll I'll use whatever it wants. I want backlighting. That's my main thing. If if there were no backlighting, I'm like oh, I I prefer to have backlit keys of some form. But otherwise, I'm like no, it, just a good feeling key switch is all I need. Although I have to say, like I don't know that I've ever worn out a key 
on a on a keyboard before so i'm like more durable than like what are they 50 million actuations i'm like that's a lot of typing yeah they're going i think cherry has gone up to like 80 and there are some people with 100 million um one thing about the backlighting so it, it does have white backlighting but it's kind of like tricky to find I've, I've actually seen people cover this keyboard and say there's no backlighting um, but you have to hold FN and the arrow keys, which is not like very hmm. uncommon, but it's not labeled. And then there's also like a solid breathing or solid lighting or breathing and then different speeds. So like it's FN and like different arrows to kind of toggle between the different speeds and settings. It's not very intuitive. So they're not labeled on the keyboard, which yeah. makes it hard. <laughs> yeah, so it's a little secretive. Um, it looks like the, it, based on the way you had it, the cable's removable. Is it... Okay, so is that what kind of key, what kind of cable is it? <laughs> it's a detachable micro USB to Type uh, A. The, uh, I knew something had to break my heart. It's not <laughs> standard USB rubber. It's just standard rubber as well. And also, I think it's you know mildly interesting. Um, so it's detachable. A lot of keyboard cables go here. This one's actually over here. Yeah. So that could be kind yeah. of helpful depending on you how your get setup a micro, is. micro micro cable to USB C though, if you wanted, and just replace it, right? Like an adapter? Uh, I guess. Not adapter. I mean, well, I'm just saying, like, he's like, oh, it's not USB C. I'm like, well, there should just be cables that go from micro USB to USB C on the other oh, end. Oh, I meant I want it to be USB C to USB A. Oh, I see. So yeah, I have snob. a couple questions. Um, Darth Mike, because he's got like two eyes in there. Um, he wants to know if key travel distance affects gaming. Um, I guess that's a preference question. Um, there are switches that are built for, that are meant to be faster because they have shorter travel. Like Cherry has um, some low profile switches that are meant to do that. Um, and then there are you know, a bunch of gaming vendors now making their own switches and they'll be like, oh, it's only 1.8 actuation point versus two millimeters. and it really depends on your preference. We always try to be very critical of that kind of stuff in our reviews. So you could read to see what um, we think, but I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you ever try something with like 2.2 millimeter shorter travel and you're like, yeah, I'm gaming so good. I think I it can, I think it can yeah. I was gonna say, I think it can affect it, but I'm not good enough to notice. That's the truth. <laughs> I mean, it, it is interesting to me, like when did the patent for Cherry expire? Cause like the explosion of alternative switches in the last few years is just, it's yeah. crazy to look at. It's like five years ago or whatever. <laughs> it was just like, oh, well it was only Cherry MX. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, you got Kale, you got Razors doing their own thing. You've got all these other companies doing basically similar style switches. And it's like, oh man, it's a great time to be a keyboard enthusiast, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. Like every other day I'm hearing of a new switch. And the optical switches are really picking up now too. Corsair mm -hmm. just released some, um, or one, Rocat as well. So if you think there are too many switches now, <laughs> you'll talk to yeah. me in a couple months. It's a tough choice. I, you know, I use the same keyboard for like working. Like I want to have the option to use the same keyboard for working and gaming, right? I don't. I mean, obviously a good keyboard is expensive. It's an investment. I'm probably gonna use it for a lot of stuff. So I guess the question is, which do I do more of, which is, I mean, I like my job. So good, good, it's work. But for that, I really like the key feel of something like a blue or a brown. And so mm -hmm. like, I'll sacrifice the like quietness and how and the quickness of it, of a red for something that clicky. I guess that's really like where my preference goes, but I'm also not a competitive gamer. I mean, besides- Browns are quiet, gaming, aren't they? I thought browns were relatively quiet. Yeah, browns are quiet. Yeah. So, they're tactile. But they're quick, but yeah, they're clickier than, oh. a, than a red one is. Yeah, they're not linear. That's true. Yeah. I had problems. Like, I, I reviewed some uh, ergonomic keyboards way back in the day when I was writing for Anon Tech, and they, they tended to go with brown switches. And I had two different keyboard manufacturers where something about the feel of the, of the keys over time the way I typed, I'd start getting double key presses and it was really weird and irritating to me. So I, I stopped liking Browns. Oh, poor Browns. I know. <laughs> well, ergonomic keyboards can, are very, they take a, they take a lot of getting used to. So I'm not oh yeah. I, I've yeah. still got it. Check it. Let's check it out. <sighs> Ta -da. Ta -da. 
Oh, oh wow. this is old school. And let me tell you, if you've never tried a, an ergonomic keyboard, like the uh, orthogonal key layout, it's weird. Uh, like you you look at it and it doesn't look like that big of a deal, but the learning curve is, I, I literally felt sick for a few hours <laughs> when I was trying to get used to it because I would make mistakes constantly. And the one keyboard I, I used, which was called the Tech, the Totally Ergonomic Computer Keyboard, um, the backspace on the model I reviewed was moved to the middle of the keys, like between the two halves. And every time I'd make a mistake, I'd reach to the top left to hit backspace, but that was a different key. And so it just frustrated me more. And it, it took me about two days to get used to it. And for two days, I hated it. And I thought it was the worst thing ever. And then I kind of got used to it. And I was like, oh, this is actually not bad. Um, yeah. But but the ergonomic keyboards don't work so well for gaming, usually, yeah. just because they shift keys around. And so it's like all of your games assume, assume a standard keyboard layout. And so all of a sudden, you're like, hey, wait, I can't reach that key because it's over on the right hand, not the left. So, not so ergonomic anymore, are you? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I've never seen one like them. that with like, where it like bowls in. I've, I've seen some from like Microsoft and Logitech where they're, they're kind of more split, but nothing yeah. like that before. That's, yeah, it's, it was actually really comfortable to use when I was typing on it regularly. But like I say, I got away from it and now I'm just like, mm -hmm. oh, I don't even want to try and go back to it because it, it took a while. It's like so that I fun thing when you ask somebody which, which thumb do you use to press the space bar? And like, oh, then you realize like oh, ton, tons of people are touch typists, but like they might use a slightly different finger than you do for something. And now when they're split in half and you can't do that anymore, what does that mean? I um, always hit the, almost always hit the left shift. <laughs> like I almost never use the right oh, yeah. shift key, I never, right? I never ever do. Um, so speaking of keyboards, we have a question from Javier who says there are 13, so we have a page called best gaming keyboards. I'm going to do like a mini plug and answer the question. So if you go on Tom's hardware, you can find a list of our most recommended gaming keyboards. Javier points out there are 13 keyboards. Why not a more selected list? Is it really too hard to choose one over the other? So check out that list. If you're interested in a new mechanical gaming keyboard, the reason there are so many is you kind of just picked up on it. Now there are a lot of different switch types. There are a lot of different uses. Um, so we try to cover a broad range of categories. There are also different sizes. So I have a full size one here. If you're a gamer, you might want to go 10 keyless, get a little bit more mouse room, drop the numpad. If you have a really small desk or doing some other type of work that doesn't require as much input, you can get a 60% keyboard, really tiny. So basically we're just trying to give you different options for all the different uses. And you know, I probably couldn't pick one, you know, off the top of my head, just like one for everyone, because I like loud, obnoxious keyboards. Andrew wants something that he can use at work. Jared just wants something that has a backlight. So we're just trying to give you some good options there. Um, so it looks like I pretty much answered all of our questions. So I'll just do a quick wrap up here and thank everyone who tuned into the show. We'll be back next Thursday, as always, at 3 p.m. Eastern time. You can catch us on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitch, and you we can, can talk about thirty seventy next week, right? If you're if if you tune in, yeah, <laughs> tune in next week and check out um what Jared um Jared's testing the thirty seventy. You can find out what he uncovers there, and um you know we'll be back next Thursday. So Andrew, Jared, thank you for coming. Any final words for the people? No? Um, happy holidays. It's that time of year. <laughs> thank, thank you all for watching and reading we appreciate it and thank we'll see you take care for the podcast listeners <laughs> yeah, great thank you all we'll see you next week <laughs>